presentation is on implementing a modern files management system. Today's presenter is Kent Stutz, uh, who I still can't hear, but uh, sounds like everybody else can hear him, which is good. Um, if you have any questions during the presentation, please type them in the chat box to the lower left side of your screen, and I will let Kent know, and he'll answer them during this presentation. Okay, so without further ado, um, take it away, Kent. Wow, such drama to start the day. I can't even believe it. We're so excited to be with you today. Today is the first session, the first webinar in our spring-summer season. And we're kicking it off today talking about files management. Files management is such an interesting topic. It's something that we all deal with. And uh, so we'll talk about that today. In upcoming weeks, every three weeks, Wednesday at 10 a.m., we're going to present a series of webinars that uh, myself and my, the other regional advisory people will be doing. And a lot of these have a really great information. And I would encourage you to participate. If you have any problems logging on or registering, um, talk with Rich offline or send him an email, and, and he can help you out. But these are, this is going to be a fun series. So if you have any questions, like Rich said, please feel free to type them in. I'm having the same problem that Rich is. The type is so small on my computer that I can't even read them. But perhaps Rich has a magnifying glass. Tech is kind of a problem. If you're logged on and it's working, it, it's super. If not, it's a disaster. But the nice thing is that we are recording these, and we will send you a link to um, allow you to go into the system and watch it later. We've put up a link for last semesters, the fall semesters uh, webinars, and we'll get that out to you as well so that you can catch up on any of those that you missed. We did send you a number of files that we'll be referring to today, uh, the first being the workbook. If you, if you have that available, you can take notes, write your grocery list. Uh, do whatever you please, but I hope that, uh, that they're going to be helpful to you. Today we're going to talk about the problems and benefits associated with your active files, the files in your office. We're going to talk about how to conduct a survey to kind of assess what's working and what's not, looking at the structure of the records uh, and the records system that you're using, the arrangement of those records. We'll look a little bit about at space planning and figuring out how to best use your office space to maximize storage and accessibility. We're going to look at some fabulous new equipment and supplies. We're going to figure out how to document this system with a file manual, some policies and procedures so that it really becomes a permanent part of your government. And we'll talk a little bit about maintenance, how to keep it as sweet as possible. Because everybody hates to file, let's face it. So we'll, we'll share some things that will help you to do that better. So you really can't answer this, but consider if, if you were to make a list of the five things that is making you, are making you crazy, relative to your filing system, your active files, what would they be? What is it that makes you nuts about the records in your offices? So often, we just inherit a system. We come into a job. There's filing cabinets. And we sort of just are faced with the way people have been filing active records for decades, sometimes 100 years. And so you're just sort of, that's plopped on your lap. And maybe it's the sweetest system in the world. But more than likely, it's the same system that's been being used, the same equipment being used since World War II, for Pete's sakes. And so today we're going to talk about how to look at a modern system, how to assess what you've got, and make it better. Here are some of the biggest problems we face. Look around the room. 
are you suffering with World War II era filing cabinets? Just the basic vertical cabinets that have the pull-out drawers and, you know, they should have been surplus years ago. These also have top tab filing folders and maybe just are the nastiest ever. Now, we're going to we're going to really recommend that you move to NTAB file supplies and equipment and we'll tell you why. You can do much of what we're going to suggest today on top tab in your World War II era filing cabinets or even more modern lateral filing cabinets with top tab folders. But in some ways, it's sort of like putting lipstick on a pig. I mean, you can dress it up. You can put a little foo-foo water on it. But in the end, <laughs> anyway, so um, very often we don't have any color coding mechanism with top tab filing because you can't visually see it. You have to pull the drawers out, and you're only looking at one drawer at a time. So no color coding. coding. Perhaps the organization of the files, as I had noted, that you've inherited is stinky, and so that's a problem. Very often, there is no master list of terms that is universally used throughout your local government. That can create a problem. So often also, and, and you have to admit this, there are so many inactive records crammed into these active, what are supposed to be active filing cabinets. Because sometimes we just don't want to be away from those files. We don't want to send them down into inactive storage. We don't want to box them up. It's a hassle. It's time consuming. And maybe if your storage area is not really accessible, people just don't want to do that. So that's another problem. And if we don't have any policies and procedures that talk about how to create new folders, the contents of folders, when we move them, purge them, then all of these things sort of add up to this nasty active system that just really isn't what you want to have. These kinds of systems waste your time. Do you know what the biggest cost associated with files management and your active files are? What would you guess? It's people. It's your time. It is the waste of staff time that these poor systems basically create. Very often, we can lose documents and information within these systems because maybe we're not using universal terms. Maybe one person is using one term and another group is using another. Maybe they're just so full of inactive records. We just want to keep buying more cabinets. Have you seen that? People say, well, I need more filing cabinets. Well. At, it's just because they're not purging, they're not cleaning out, they're not moving out. And this can damage records. It can also take a lot of space in offices. I was once in one city hall, and this is no joke. I walked into the office, and they had a row of just standard vertical filing cabinets. And stacked on top of this row was another complete set this was a high ceiling, they had a four drawer or five drawer filing system on top of a five drawer filing system. It was the most ridiculous and dangerous thing I had ever seen in my life. And it's just because they never moved any records out of their office. And they were using nasty old World War II era filing cabinets. This costs you tons of money. It can be a safety hazard. And it reflects really nastily if that is a word, very poorly upon you because you can't do your work nicely. Well, in contrast, when you move to a more modern system, your records can be filed accurately. They're more accessible and can be found. They're easier to use, and the information is more trustworthy. You can keep things up to date. You can use version control. You know you're not using some old version of a, of a record. It saves you space and time and money and really provides the basis for cost-effective public service. And in the end, 
it makes you super. Now, when I was a kid growing up, this was the real Superman. The whole Christopher Reeves and, and the other people, forget it. This guy here is the man. Well, let's talk a little bit about files. There's really three kinds of active files. Let's start at the bottom with uniform files. This has nothing to do with, you know, like DPW uniforms. <laughs> this is, these are records that are uniform in nature. They're in our offices. They're like vouchers and canceled checks and things like that. Records that are kind of uniform in nature and do not require any external imposition of order. It's like vouchers or, or purchase uh, requests. They have basically their numeric. They just they they just simply they're organized as they are, and you don't have to create any system to to deal with them. You just stick them in the file or or your drawer or whatever. Case files are are records that revolve around a person a place, a thing, and all of the data is associated with that case or incident or individual. For example, personnel files revolve around a particular staff member. Project files, maybe you are doing a new water district and so you develop or, or maybe you're, you're building a building or who knows what. All of the files related to those uh, that particular case is they're associated to that. Real property files, maybe all of the records related to each parcel in your local government are arranged in a real property file system. Student records are another great example, but these are just examples. And then we have the subject files, a to, you know, they're A to Z files, correspondence files. This is sort of the mishmash of the day-to-day -day work. And so these really are the three that we're dealing with. The uniform files we're not going to deal with because they have kind of a self-imposed or obvious order that we don't have to do anything with, per se. So let's talk about this system, about approaching the development of a new filing system. Basically, seven steps we're going to look at to review, overhaul, and implement, maintain a modern filing system. So the first thing you really need to do is kind of get a handle of what records you're going to deal with. This may be all of the records, all of the active records. We're not talking about the ones in the basement. All of the active records in a particular office or a particular department or conceivably, depending upon the size of your government, the entire government. If you're like a small, um, a small school district or a small village or town, it's conceivable, but often people approach this on an office or department by department basis. And so we're looking to identify these record series. We always deal with record series because it's kind of easier to get our head around them rather than individual folders or individual documents, obviously. So you evaluate the active files, say in your office, record series by record series. How are they organized? We'll talk about that. Um, are there duplicates? Are there non-records mixed in? Um, you may also evaluate whether there are records that are no longer active and can be moved into inactive record storage, box them up and move them out. So the whole idea here is to kind of identify the two or three or four or five, six different active record series, figuring out in the cabinets where they begin and where they end, and um, sort of going from there. Just to give you an example, if you have a correspondence file, say an A to Z subject file, that entire thing would be one record series. You can open it up and see that from A to Z there are all kinds of different things, different subjects, and maybe different kinds of records in there, but as you have imposed an A to Z subject filing system, 
upon these records, then that is one record series. And so that's important to realize. You can, you know, we have an inventory worksheet. Some people like to use part of that to kind of gather this information. It's totally up to you. Surveying records is kind of like inventory light. You're not really, really digging down into all of the variables and things, but you could. It, it just really depends upon the records you're looking to evaluate and change. So another thing in terms of the survey is to figure out how these records are being used. Who are the users? Is there a workflow within the office? Do they go from different people to different people? Or is it just pretty much static and they sit there? And also, you have to evaluate kind of special considerations, issues of confidentiality, um, records that are vital in nature, meaning that they need extra security or maybe extra care. Um, there are some records that if they burned in a fire, you would be very, very upset with. There are also other records that conceivably could be, I mean, if you had a bunch of canceled checks burn, are you going to go home and shoot yourself? I don't think so. Go to the bank, get a copy, it's all right. But what happens if your marriage licenses or something that's really, really important, your student records, your active student records, they burn and you might as well just you know, retire because it's going to be a problem. So you're really trying to figure out what's working and what's not in your current system. And this evaluation can be very straightforward or it can be something a little bit more arduous where you put a lot of thought and effort into it. So this is kind of an interesting thing, developing a file structure. And when we're talking about that, we're kind of looking at the structure of our local government, the offices, the departments, and figuring out how things are organized within our organization. I'm kind of being redundant there. I'll give you an example of why we do this. This isn't always necessary. But sometimes when you implement a new filing system, you are going to adapt it to the modern structure of your local government. And I'll, I'll give you one example. So let's, let's talk about real property records. In your local government, you may have a zoning office or department. You may have a building. You may have a codes. You may have a tax. Um, office, and all of these records in these various offices within your organization relate to real property files. And one group may have building permits, other people may have tax rules, somebody else has variant stuff, the planning board has some other stuff, but you can see that the structure of the local government and its organization could conceivably inform your creation of a new record system. Let's say all of these people have these records individually in their offices and you want to go and implement a new centralized filing system for all real property records. Well, you would be bringing records from these different offices conceivably and knowing the organization and, and interviewing people, perhaps part of it's your own knowledge, you're looking at the existing systems, it could be that this would be very, very helpful. It may not help at all. It may be you're just dealing with some records within your own office, but it's conceivable. And if you get to a larger organization, like a county or a large city, let's take it a look at something like um, the Department of Social Services. It's conceivable that within that large office, there are a lot of different departments or divisions. And so you kind of figure this out. And so we raise this as an important point, something to look at. Sometimes what you want to do, rather than looking at departments or the topic of the records, we're not running a library here, you really want to look at the structure or the main functions 
of these records. And I'm going to show you a sample in just a moment from the town of Salina where they went through and they kind of looked at all of the functions of the records that they created and came up with kind of a nifty system. And so here's just a really quick example. So at the highest level, there's a function or a subject. And maybe that's land use. And under that, there's an activity. So under land use, there's a lot of different activities that a government could be involved with. In this instance, we're looking at planning, the planning function of local government. And one of the sub-activities of the planning function, there's a planning board. And there are other, perhaps, officers or departments or things related to planning, but planning board is one of those. And one of the record series that the planning board creates are minutes. And so this is just kind of a simple way to create a hierarchy related to the function or organization of your local government. And it's a way of kind of looking at it to see if structuring it differently can improve access and storage of these important active records. We're going to talk about centralization and decentralization of active records in a second. That's going to bear on this, but you'll have to wait because that's, that comes later. So file arrangement is something we're very, very aware of. It is a core element of any filing system. It's basically how the records are organized. And one really good tip is to evaluate whether or not the records are currently being filed as they are requested. In other words, as information is needed, either by staff or the public. And so there's a bunch of different ways to arrange records. And just because they're arranged in a certain way now, doesn't mean that that's the best way to do it. And so we want to evaluate, as a part of this process, the arrangement of your various record series. So we're familiar with alphabetical. There's subject arrangements. There's numerical arrangements. Some people have numerical systems. Tax map number is a good example. Um, there's very few instances that we use chronological arrangement. Minutes are a good example, but that's, again, one of those uniform record series that we really don't have to impose any additional order on. They're, we just arrange them in our, in our minute books according to date. And then there's hybrid systems where you kind of maybe impose some kind of hierarchy. You might have um, a subject, and then under that subject, you may have years, like, you know, arranged in different ways. There's just a whole lot of ways of doing this. But file arrangement is a very, very important thing to consider. When you change a file organization, the, the file arrangement, you really do it only because it would improve access and give you the benefits we've talked about. You just don't do it to be doing it. So here's another example, something we just mentioned. A lot of local governments who in the past have arranged their real property records by property address or property owner are moving in many instances to a tax map number. And this really yields some wonderful benefits, particularly if you go to NTAB filing and using color coding and letters and numbers on the uh, system, it can be very, very, very helpful. So it's just one example. I'm not really giving you any time to ask questions, am I? Please feel free, if there's anything you'd like to chat about, to ask Rich a question, and we can, we can stop at any time. So here's just a couple of tips. And these are somewhat self-evident. So keep the topic heading short. Don't type an entire essay on your, on your file folders. We're going to talk about a master list of terms and how important that can be in a moment. So you want to create and use that. 
you may use different levels. That is to say, if you have a very complex topic, in, in this instance, we're looking at file, at subject, a subject um, filing system. You have something that's very, very complex. You know that often you'll break that into sub topics. And that can be based on any arrangement you desire. And in hybrid systems, often you will do that. Um, it's recommended that you don't use more than three levels. And we'll, we'll show you the Salina sample that does that. Also, you'll want to use cross-references. So in your master list of terms, and basically this is a list of all the terms that you as a local government have determined to use uniformly so that everyone throughout your local government is calling a particular thing the same, by the same name. And so you will include in that cross-references. So think about something, a subject such as, um, I'm trying to think of the appropriate word for it. Um, like, they don't call it a dump anymore. What do they call it? When you, when you <laughs> landfill. So you've got a landfill. Some people call it a dump. Some people call it garbage. Who knows what? But anyway, the point is that you use the same, the same kind of thing and use cross-references so that people aren't using topics that you don't want. So we sent out a, a, um, a file containing the town of Salina master file plan. And basically what they did was they reevaluated all of the active records that they're currently creating in each of the different departments. And they came up with five primary main filing functions, administration, courts, fiscal, land use, and public services. And they assigned a three-letter um, code to each of those. And then under that, those different functions of local government. They have subheadings. And then a tertiary level where the record series are listed. I'm going to show you that in just a second so that it makes more sense. But the neat thing about this, it's sort of like an office retention schedule. And we really push office retention schedules. And this is sort of a cool way to do this. It doubles as both. I'll show you in just a second, but it identifies this sample identifies how long you keep a particular record in the office versus in inactive storage. And it also identifies the office of um, record or where the official record copy of that document is stored. And so it's kind of cool. Let me show you this. Now, this isn't in your work notes. Huh. Oh, look at that. It didn't get in there. I didn't. I, I have the wrong file. Well, when you have a chance, Pull out the file, the sample file that we sent you in Word format, and take a look at it and see how cool it is. Now, some people think it's too complex, and others think it's perfect, but it's something that possibly may spur some interest in how you might organize your records or impose a different order. So for example, under um, the main heading for land use, there may be a secondary heading of the planning board of real properties that the town owns, and et cetera, et cetera. And under those different examples, then there could be a series of records that relate to this. This is kind of where the example that we showed you before with land use came from. Let me just see if I can go back really quickly. There it is. So the main subject is land use. There's planning underneath that planning board, and then uh, the board minutes. So take a look at that sample, and I think you'll find it to be interesting, if nothing else, just to spur some interest or creativity in, in what you uh, decide to use. So why do we use this master list of terms? It really creates consistent use of terminology. 
And that's really, really important when you're implementing a new system. It kind of eliminates similar terms that we don't want to use through cross-references. It really creates order where, generally speaking, these systems devolve into chaos or chaos. If, if left to our own devices, we just create all kinds of crazy terms and in a not too, within a very short period of time, different offices are calling the same things by different names. This totally helps with retrieval. It reduces filing errors dramatically. And we sent you also a sample of this. Um, this sample was actually derived from a function we used to do a lot of. We used to index minutes manually. And we found that having a master list of terms for that was absolutely, absolutely essential. And then as we evaluated the need for a master list of terms for filing, they're exactly the same. And so you can adapt or take a look at the sample that we've sent you. But I think you'll find it to be a very interesting document. And trying to impose that on people throughout your organization can be a little tricky. But as you, and you wouldn't do that unless you were converting their active records into a new modern system. But as you move forward department by department or office by office, you really want to impose some kind of a uniform subject term listing. And as people want to add and delete from that list, they do it um, under your supervision or under a liaison from that from some other office who's maintaining that. It sounds a little a little scary, but I think that when you see the list, it will make it'll make some sense. And it's absolutely critical if you want to maintain order in these filing systems. Well, in terms of filing conventions, we often do this with electronic records. And the interesting thing is that as you develop a new filing system, many people find that they want to mirror that paper filing system, the improved one, in terms of a folder structure and naming conventions, they want to replicate that on their servers so that the paper filing systems are the same as the electronic filing systems. And these things are very much merging in a lot of ways. And so you impose the same kind of structure on your, uh, on your network server. This isn't necessary if you're using um, electronic document management um, software because it pulls it from any folder you're, you're, you've assigned. But uh, this is kind of interesting. And so you figure out standard ways of using names, standard ways of ordering names of these elements. For example, um, here's a, a way to do a date, um, a way to identify a particular version of a document. Um, so the key is to make this very simple. Don't make it so complex that people either don't understand it or don't follow it. But creating naming conventions is a very important part of this process. It's a way of, again, creating order and uniformity. So we've got to look at the space. Usually, when you convert to a modern filing, to modern filing equipment, they are going to have different floor space um, requirements than the old World War II filing cabinets. And so you can kind of create a floor plan to scale. That's sort of fun. Every time my wife remodels our house, she has a little floor plan and she moves the furniture around. It's great fun. I mean, it's like HGTV right there in your own place. So um, evaluate the workflow. How are these records moving? Are they moving? from department to department or from office to office? Do they just stay where they are? Is that something that you need to consider? Um, 
Calling in vendors is really a great idea because they're going to be selling equipment and they have a sense of how this works in that they do it very often. And you can create templates and, and it it's, can be very fun. Really the important thing though are where people work and to make sure that you're considering the workflow and the people flow more than just the fact that you can stick so many cabinets in a particular area. And once you've perfected it, you really want to get buy-in from the users of those systems and also whoever it is that's actually going to be approving the project because you don't want to plan something and move forward and not really have buy-in. There's nothing worse than having something imposed upon you that, uh, that you don't like, some new system. So not only are you planning for the equipment itself, but also realizing that when drawers are open or cabinets are open, it's conceivable that that takes up some of the space for working, be moving between work areas. And we'll talk again just in a moment about centralization versus decentralized storage. But one large area is much more preferable for, for centralized storage than many, many uh, decentralized sites. So make sure that you have room for growth. You don't want to develop a system, buy new cabinets, move over to a new system, and not provide um, additional space in that, in that area for expansion, because records do seem to grow. And consider peak use of various filing systems or, or equipment. This is not often the case, but there are times of the year and times of the week and day and month where particular records are used more regularly. And so as you evaluate how you're going to basically structure the different record series within these cabinets, you don't want to be sticking the most active records all in one little cabinet where everybody's going to want to be getting into during peak use, if that makes sense. And you know, often this isn't really a big, huge issue. So here's the thing. People like to have their records close to them, the, the records that they use. They don't like to travel very far. But the honest truth is that the more centralized you can make your filing systems, the more efficient they're going to be. It uses floor space more efficiently. You can manage the records more efficiently. You can, it, 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 it's just, it's a proven fact that centralized storage of active records is the most efficient, cost-effective way to do it. However, again, people often like to have their records close to them. And so completely decentralizing them, everybody having a cabinet in their little cubbyhole or their office um, may be essential. But And maybe you might not be able to get away with this depending upon the size of your government in, for the whole department or a whole office, but this is a principle that you need to keep in the back of your mind. A lot of people use hybrid solutions. That is to say, I'll give you an example. Um, let's say you are in a school district and you're a guidance counselor at a high school. Well, you're assigned X number of students. And sometimes you have certain records related to those students, maybe their whole file, in your office in a decentralized cabinet. That's one way of dealing with it. And maybe there are other records that are centralized. The key would be, if you really, really want to implement an effective system, would be to figure out how, what is the highest level of centralization people are willing to do is there an area, a physical area close to everyone's workstations where you can centralize 
records so that they don't have to walk, you know, half a mile across the building. We mentioned this just to consider. And I would recommend that you move towards centralization at the highest level that is practical and that people will accept. And then I think you'll find much more efficiency. Well, this is the most exciting part of the whole thing. We're going to show you a bunch of modern filing equipment and supplies. Uh, nothing like getting a grant uh, for several thousand dollars and getting to go to Staples and buy a bunch of fun stuff. Well, I wouldn't necessarily go to Staples, but buying a bunch of fun stuff and it's not even your money. So let's, let's take a look at this. We don't like vertical filing cabinets. These are the old nasty World War II era with top tab. We're trying to eliminate those. So even, even Latin, more modern lateral filing cabinets that are top tab, we, we won't buy them in grants whatsoever. So let me show you what we'll buy with grant money and it's pretty exciting. So there's lateral filing cabinets or open shelving. That's pretty cool. That's sort of like the doctor's office or the uh, dentist's office filing system. Now these are open. There's also models that have closed down doors in front of them that give you security when you're not there or you can just secure the, the room. It just sort of depends upon if the records themselves are confidential that you need that secondary um, security. But you could imagine that you come in at the beginning of the day and you just roll the doors up or you open the door and there they are and see how all the color coding and everything is available. It's a very visual experience rather than opening up one cabinet or one drawer at a time. To the right, you see the rotary shelving. One brand of this is called Times Two Units. These are fabulous. These basically provide twice the storage per square foot of floor space than a standard filing cabinet. They're basically a cabinet inside a cabinet and there's a little pedal down to the lower right and you actually push that and it rotates around. And um, you basically can see half of it at once. But the beautiful thing about NTAB filing supplies is that you're not limited to looking, having to look down on a drawer. Even the shortest person can look and see the color coding and letter system that's on the end tab and reach up and pull it from the highest level. And it's really quite fabulous. We have a lot of people who are going to this rotary shelving or times two units and, and I have only heard one person complain and that was only because they were cranky and born like in 1900 and, and like the World War I era filing cabinets. Compact file storage is kind of cool, also known as mobile shelving. It sort of eliminates the aisles and you can do a lot of different things with this. There, there are mechanized systems and there are ones where you just twirl them around. In a local school district, we had a, 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 an area that they wanted to convert and they evaluated the cost between compact file storage, mobile shelving, versus rotary shelving or the times two units. And they figured out that for the space they had, that it was actually more cost effective to use the mobile shelving than to use the rotary shelving. And they just love it. It was for all of their active student records for the counselors. In addition to the mobile shelving, there's also mechanized storage. These are like electrievers. They're like giant Ferris wheels. And, they, and the records travel up. They're indexed. You can plug in a number and it just pops it up right to the place. These are very expensive, rather heavy. They have to really be on a concrete floor. Um, but anyway, these are kind of some of the, these are the kinds of new modern filing equipment that grants will pay for. They are rather pricey. Well, just the open filing shelving isn't pricey, but, but the others are pretty, pretty costly.
So if you consider that, we are moving from top tab folders in vertical filing cabinets to end tab folders. We're eliminating hanging folders. They don't work in end tab systems. And we're also implementing color coding. And we're, there's ways of doing file guides, which is basically to separate the different record series, to put in kind of breaks that visually allow you to scan the, uh, the area instead of looking for specific names or, or uh, titles at the top of the um, folders. And we're using labeling in a different way with these systems. So basically, what we're doing is assigning letters or numbers in addition to color to help us create a more visually accessible filing system. In essence, what you begin to do is you are reading colors and some letters and numbers in a way that makes you ac access these records much, much more quickly. And the fact that they're, the fact that you have imposed these fabulous color arrays based on the system you determine, mis misfiling, having something out of place, is almost impossible because the color coding just throws you completely off. It, it's almost impossible to stick it back in the wrong place. These labels can be applied by hand, or um, there's a couple of ways to do them with by machine. You can get them commercially printed. So I'll give you an example. Let's say you're converting over to a tax map system with your real property records, and you know the series of numbers that you're going to use. You can create a database or a spreadsheet and give that to the folks who print these commercially, and they'll spit out the labels, either letters, numbers, color coding, in any way you, you desire. But so, so often, we're creating our own custom labels, and it's not something that you can just really submit in advance because you're sort of doing it folder by folder. You can buy little printers that just spit out these labels. They're not terribly expensive. So these are some of the different ways of, of doing this. And by hand applied, I mean you, you print them out and you apply them yourself rather than having them applied at a commercial facility. So this is really, really helpful in terms of creating a new system. Basically, you're going to be customizing or developing this NTAB system for each record series. Um, you're going to try to standardize your approach throughout your organization, or at least department by department as you roll that out. You'll want to keep it simple because there's a lot of folks that don't like complexity. We find that about a one-inch label gives a good effect in terms of either a letter or series of letters, a series of numbers, or the color coding as well. There are also some, some lower tech color coding solutions out there. I know a lot of people who have implemented color coding on their top, top tab files um, using little Avery color buttons and stuff like that. I'll give you an example. This is kind of a good example. Um, you've, got a, you've got a police department or a court and they want to be able to separate the active files, the case files that are retained for six full years versus DWIs or, or ones that have to be retained for 25 years or longer. And so they'll put a little red marker on the DWIs or 25-year retention or beyond. And it's just kind of a low-tech way of, of segregating those so that when you go to dispose of them, you don't have to um, go folder by folder and purge. You've already done that when the folder or the case file is created. Another thing you might consider as you're going through and sort of implementing a new system, there may be some record series that 
you want to consider reformatting, scanning usually, creating a doc an electronic document management system to improve access. Imaging is really all about improved access, more than storage. It's, it's really about access. And so this is something you want to keep in the back of your head. As you are surveying a record series, as you're thinking about how to manage it paper-wise, it's just possible that the best way to improve access is to scan them and get rid of the paper altogether. And for long-term records, things you have to keep a long, long time, you might even consider backing up those digital images with computer output microfilm or COM. That way you can sleep at night knowing that you've got microfilm that'll probably last 500 years, whereas um, any digital document is, is uh, challenging to retain and preserve long term. So this might be an option. File use and access. You really want to be able to track the movement of these records. Some people use out, code, out cards. Some people use barcoding. I'll give you a quick example. Um, at a, at a, oh, what, what was it? It was a, um, a county lockup, basically. And they had medical services. And so each of the prisoners had a folder with their medical case files. And there's a lot of people pulling and using those over the course of many days and weeks. And so they found the best way to do it was to use a barcoding system, very inexpensive. And every folder had a barcode. And when it was checked out, they scanned it. And when they brought it back, they scanned it. And radio frequency IDs, this kind of takes it to another level. And this probably isn't the solution for most people. But basically, there's a little chip in the folder. And when everybody wears a little um, name tag with a sensor, when you go through a certain door, it picks up the fact that you've gone through the door with the folder. And it records it. And when you bring it back, it does that. This, again, this is the kind of thing that's used in a very, very sophisticated system where a lot of people are using it. I have a Department of Health, a County Department of Health that uses this because they really, really, really need to keep track of their things. Other people use databases to track, search, report, and identify where the records are. Depending upon your specific office, you may not need any of this. Um, you may just need an out card so that when somebody pulls a file, they just they can write it up. Or you may not even need that because there's just two or three of you using them. So it's important. And particularly when you're dealing with confidential and records that are vitally important, um, you need to make sure that you restrict public access and that they are given the security and the protection they need, not only against people, but also fire and flooding and things such as that. Well, you really want to be able to document this system. You're going to be creating this system from scratch in many instances. And you want to be able to help people, to be able to train them, and to create order so that everybody sort of implements it in the same way. This does not have to be a really complicated thing. I've seen a file manual that was one or two pages. And so it basically helps you to control your records in that particular uh, record series or group of records. It can help improve access. It really will help you to um, purge records when they need to be and, and reduce misfiling. It just really creates a foundation or permanence in your active record system. They're great to use for training. And if you go to court, if there's a high profile case and you don't have some kind of a filing manual or system um, that is documented, it's not going to look very good for you. So uh, what kind of components would you consider adding? And by the way, I think we also sent you, this was the third, um, the third word file, the sample, um, a sample file manual. It kind of, it doesn't give a lot of detail, but it gives a lot of different topics that you might address in this. And so here are the basic ones. What's the structure and organization that you've imposed upon these particular records? Is there a particular 
uh, methodology or steps in establishing a new file. So at the beginning of the year, you hire someone new. What what is included in a new personnel file, a new student file? What's included in um, and it doesn't make any difference, but that's that's the way you do it. Is there a particular order to the records in the folder? Um, is there a way that you update that? Who's responsible? Is there is there a particular staff position or whatever who is to do what? And that that's an important part. What's the retention period? How long are you going to keep them in the active office? When are you going to move them into storage? And how long do they have to stay there? Uh, what are the rules relative to disposition and purging those records? Are there restrictions in terms of who can access them and the security protocols involved? And when do you transfer them? And when do you dispose of them? We kind of said that. So those are some of the things that you might consider adding to your, your file, your manual, which are kind of like policies and procedures. I mean, really, a file manual is policies and procedures for active filing systems. And so we're looking to, to do that. And some of the other things you might consider is controlling duplicates. So often, we add and subtract and um, version control, duplicate control becomes a very important thing. Now, this whole business about maverick filing spaces. Now, if you're old enough to remember Maverick, the TV show, you know that you're probably at least 60 years old. <laughs> anyway, um, but a young 60. You just basically don't want people hiding files. You come up with a system. Maybe it's a little more centralized than people are used to. And all of a sudden, they've got this little cubby hole where they're sticking secret files. Well, you know what? You got to say, man, you're not Jack Bauer. Put the files back. We're monitoring you, yada, yada. So, And follow the retention. Once you've developed a great system like this, you hate for people not to follow it, because maintaining a system is really, really not that easy. And so you train staff. You try to provide them with an understanding of the, how to use the equipment, how to use the new filing system, maybe buying into the master list of terms. Um, basically, you try to keep it simple in a way that will allow them to follow it and not give you excuses. But this is really, really a great tool for training new people. Imagine if you came into your office that you hold now and this was provided for you. It would be such an amazing benefit. So to recap, basically what we would consider in this instance, unless you're just simply implementing, you know, we've talked about a lot of principles today. And you could, could, you could go back and you could implement many of these same principles on and within your World War II era cabinets or more modern lateral filing, even if you don't convert to NTAB, but you won't get all of these benefits. So if you're converting a, a particular office or function, you'll start by purchasing your new filing equipment after doing all the survey business. You'll purchase your supplies, and basically you'll convert folder by folder as you go along. And as you do this, as you come up with ideas on how to do it, you'll develop this file manual sort of as you go, so that by the end of the project, you can write it up formally, get approvals, make sure that it works for everyone, and make adjustments to how you want to develop and implement the system. And I would really, really recommend that you start on your own files, because you're going to work out some kinks. There's going to be some setbacks. And you'd rather do that on your own files so that when people see the finished result after these hurdles, they say, oh my gosh, this is the most amazing thing I've ever seen. When are you converting my files? And you're looking like a million bucks, but you're not kind of doing trial and error in the open with everyone's 
own records. So, final question. As you consider these principles we've discussed today, where will you start to improve your acting active filing? I was going to say your acting career. <laughs> where will you start to improve your active filing systems? What records are giving you the most trouble? What would you like to do? All of the things that we've talked about are available through our grants program. So it's something to consider. Kent, I was going to mention that uh, I've got my microphone to work, I think. Yes. Or we're both on. Um, if anybody has any questions, um, the print for me and Kent, I'm not sure if everybody else, is very, very small. It's smaller than the fine print uh, found in any of the best legal documents. But if I see that somebody had typed uh, type a question, I can um, copy and paste it into another document and read it off. Uh, it just may be a little bit, uh, I uh, may ask folks for just to, to bear with me while I do that. But if anybody has any questions, um, please feel free to, to type uh, them in the chat box. And just to let everybody know, this session uh, is being recorded, and it will be available um, uh, probably probably within about an hour or so after we, we conclude. Um, we will be sending you a brief survey so we can learn from you um, uh, and uh, get your thoughts on about our webinar and how we can improve. Um, so we really appreciate everybody filling that uh, that in. Um, let's see, I've got a question here. It looks like from Jermaine. So I'm, I brought my monitor over the window so I can see it better. <laughs> I wish I had my Swiss Army knife with the magnifying glass in there. That's uh, what you can, need. It's, uh, the question is, can you send the workbook with samples? And uh, Sure, we can definitely. Uh, well, we have the workbook that we sent. I'm not sure, if Kent, if you have any thoughts on that. Well, I think the three samples that we sent, depending upon what you're really looking at, may be a good starting point. And you're really, really welcome to um, email your regional advisory person, or Rich, or myself. Um, our emails are all on on the state archives website, and uh, we'd be we'd be happy to talk that through with you. Really happy. Thanks everybody for coming. It's been great. Come on back in three weeks. I think Linda Bull from the Poughkeepsie office is going to be presenting a really interesting webinar on developing, enhancing, resurrecting, or reconstituting a fabulous records, overall records management program. So whether you're uh, Superman or things are in the dump, I think that she is really, really going to be able to show you some great tips on basically developing or resurrecting a great records program um, in all of its aspects. So thanks so much for coming. Bye-bye.